So folks, really, we are hours away from the first test for old Donnie just to see how strong his cult really is. And we know that he basically gets no meaningful opposition from within his own party because there's really only a few people with the R next to their name that aren't a part of the cult. And most of those people have been forced out of any significant amount of power. But where the opposition really is coming from is one, folks like you, regular Americans in their thousands and in their millions opposing the fascist monster, but also top Democrats. And what I have for you is top Democrats uniting, some of them more moderate, some of them more progressive, but uniting in a common cause to rip Trump apart tonight and to make it clear that he is a clown deserving of mockery. With Trump, we have to balance that. We have to mock him. One, because it gets under his skin. And two, because he's objectively a buffoon worthy of mockery. But we also have to remember that just because we mock him, it doesn't mean he isn't dangerous. And the danger is only growing. And what this shows is that from his personal to his political conduct, Democrats are doing the work that no one else is to expose this SOB. So hit the like and subscribe button. And as I've been saying, people ask me questions. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because if you watch every second of this, YouTube will show it to more people. This is the trick of YouTube. If you want progressives to win, watch all my videos and watch them all the way through and do the same for other channels too. They'll show our videos beyond the bubble and conservatives will see it. They never get to see Democrats talking because they only usually watch Fox. If you help this video go viral, they'll see it and they'll actually get a dose of truth and honesty for once. Nearly eight million dollars that Donald Trump received from foreign governments when he was president. Mm -hmm. House Oversight Democrats dropped that bombshell and brought the receipts in a report earlier this month. The foreign government spent the money at Trump's hotels and businesses while Donald Trump was in the White House. Now, Congressman Jamie Raskin is demanding that Donald Trump give it back. Trump, of course, insists he did nothing wrong. And the Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland joins us now. He is the ranking member of the House Oversight Committee. Congressman, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, you sent a letter to Donald Trump Friday demanding uh, that he return about $7.8 million. Have you gotten a response from the former president yet? No response yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I should <clears throat> point out quickly that that's a fraction mm -hmm. of what he got. Uh, that represented two years, the first two years of his presidency. We didn't get the two years because Chairman Comer cut off discovery, at least according to Trump lawyers. Um, they told Mazars they don't have to turn anything else over. So we got two years for only four of uh, Donald Trump's businesses out of more than 500 businesses, and that was just 20 countries out of 195 countries on earth. So it gives you a sense of it, but people are coming up to me on the floor saying just $8 million. We thought he was taking a lot more than that. Well, that just scratches the surface. To be clear, some of the biggest spenders were um, Saudi Arabia, China. Uh, they spent this money at his hotels, um, his golf his golf clubs. Uh, the chairman, as we discussed this um, when this news first broke, mm -hmm. he, he reminded me of the emoluments. I'm like, yeah, we all became emoluments experts <laughs> during this time. This is a clear violation. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, that's the heart of the thing. The Constitution says that the president or any other federal official cannot accept a present and emolument, which mm -hmm. means a payment, an office or title of any kind, whatever, that's in the Constitution, uh, from a king, a prince, a foreign government without the consent of Congress. Donald Trump came to Congress zero times to ask to keep this money. And if you go back and look at the history of it from George Washington to Barack Obama, nobody ever did anything remotely like that. I mean, Abraham Lincoln got these two elephant tusks that he loved from the King of Siam. During the Civil War, he went to Congress. He said, can we, can we keep these? Congress said, no, turn them over to the Department of Interior, and he promptly turned them over. Um, so, you know, you recall Obama was given the Nobel Peace Prize, and he was told, well, it doesn't violate the text of the Monuments uh, Clause because uh, the Nobel Committee is not the Swedish government, mm -hmm. but the spirit of it, yeah, and he turned the money over. $1.3 million. John F. Kennedy, uh, Ireland said, we'd like to make you a citizen. We love you so much. And again, they said, doesn't technically violate the text of the 
uh, a monuments clause, but the spirit certainly, and so he turned it down. So Donald Trump did something nobody had ever done before. He tried to convert the presidency into a money-making enterprise, mm. and he did. And now his sons are out there saying, well, he didn't take his federal salary of $400,000 a year. That's all you're allowed to take. You're not supposed to be on the payroll for Saudi monarchs and Chinese communist yeah. bureaucrats. You're supposed to be getting paid by the American people. And they said, well, he returned the profits from the foreign governments. Well, that's not what the Constitution says. It doesn't say you can't keep the profits. It says you can't keep one dollar without going to Congress first. So if you think Congress would allow you to keep $7.8 million, come to Congress and uh, we'll decide. But at this point, he's long overdue. Pay the money back. Well, it's not just his. Joining me now is Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff, who served on the House January 6th committee and was the lead manager during Trump's first impeachment. So, Congressman Schiff, one, thank you for your time this afternoon. I, I just, it's so crazy what he's saying, which is why it's so important to point it out. So I really wanted to ask you first, if if Trump, what he's calling for here, if this were what were to happen, that there would no, be no, uh, no, no president would be held accountable for their actions, what would that mean exactly? Well, it is every bit as crazy as it sounds. It means that a president could order the assassination of his political opponents uh, and not be held accountable. It means that a president could threaten the life of a Senate president if they brought impeachment uh, proceedings and not be held accountable. Uh, essentially, it would, to quote Justice Goldberg, it would turn the Constitution into a suicide pact. And the Constitution is not a suicide pact. It doesn't require its own destruction. Uh, but to interpret the way Donald Trump would interpret the con Constitution, uh, it would nullify any of the protections the American people have from a despot or despotism. Uh, I think the tougher question, frankly, the Court of Appeals may have to deal with is, should they decide this before there's a verdict in the case? That may be the closer question. But on the merits of this, is a president immune uh, while in office from uh, being prosecuted for committing crimes when he leaves office? The answer is clearly no. And I think even with the current Supreme Court, uh, they're going to conclude, no, you don't have that kind of immunity. And, and even if the legal, uh, the courts rule, as you just said, and I think that's what a lot of legal es experts are suggesting, it still gives us some insight into Donald Trump's thinking and to kind of what he thinks his powers would be if he were president. How does that sit with you? And, and what should people know about what that reflects? Uh, and that's absolutely right. And you'll remember, uh, and I may not have the quote exactly right, but uh, he essentially said that the, uh, that Article 2 uh, gives him the power to do whatever he wants. Uh, as President of the United States, he, there is no limitation to his power, authority, immunity, uh, or capability to tear down our institutions to do whatever he wants. And this is you know, quite the terrifying thing about him running for president again, which is he would start from the low point he ended. He would begin, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with insurrection. Uh, that is, when he started out, he had at least some people of stature. He got rid of them for people of no stature. He got rid of them, in turn, for people who were utter sycophants. Uh, and now there would be no, no boundaries, no guardrails, no nothing. And he's made it absolutely plain. Uh, he'll be dictator on day one, and that's the way he wants it. And his, ins his the insight into how he's going to approach this is so important, which is why I wanted to talk to you about it. Now, if you believe the polls, I mean, there was a new poll that came out overnight, NBC News, Des Moines Register poll, that basically shows that despite all of this, Republican voters in the primary are set to register their approval for Trump. They're set to say, basically, this is his guy, despite all the indictments, his comments about echoing Hitler. I'm just wondering, you know, as, you, as we sit here the day before the Iowa caucus, what you make of that and what it tells us about the Republican electorate. Well, it, it tells us uh, I think there's been a real failure of leadership within the Republican Party. Uh, these candidates that are running against Trump aren't willing to take him on fully. They're not willing to go after him. Uh, they seem to be competing for whoever can come in second, uh, not even with an eye to being his running mate, but with an eye to running four years from now. Uh, and because none of them are willing to uh, call him out on what he is, which is a profound danger to our country, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, somehow now have normalized his conduct, his behavior. Well, if these others aren't willing to call him out on his 91 felony charges, well, then they must be OK or they must must be something wrong or political about them. Uh, so I think there's been a total failure of leadership 
among the Republican Party. Uh, and uh, I also think, though, that in terms of the presidential election and the ultimate general election contest, uh, it's going to be very important for President Biden to continue emphasizing everything he's doing to meet economic challenges Americans are facing. We all saw what was going on in that House chamber this week. You know, the the comparison between what the Democrats were trying to do, which was, number one, get Hunter Biden to be able to testify publicly so everybody could hear it. I mean, like, why cherry pick stuff? But number two, showing that the hypocrisy of the GOP is alive and well in D.C. I mean, I don't know. How did you navigate that particular hearing? Because you're a lawyer, you're a member of Congress. And so you know what facts, evidence and the law actually were. And I'm a representative. And so the first thing I did was take a step back and think like, well, what do the people uh, I represent care about? It's certainly not Republicans acting as Donald Trump's lawyer, you know, as the largest law firm in Washington, D.C., working for just one client. They want breathing room in their finances. They want their health care costs to come down. They want their kids to be safe at school from gun violence. And, and these guys, they're just an echo for Donald Trump. There, there's nothing that they do uh, that works to benefit anyone who's in need. And, and then I think about Donald Trump and, and you listen to the grievances and what you played in the opening. It's just me, me, me. And I think what President Biden has to do is make it clear as we go to the next 10 months into November that this election for him is going to be about you and what you need in your life. You have some sad news that I need to share with everyone. This budding romance or bromance, I should say, between Donald Trump and Vivek Ramaswamy <laughs> appears to have come to a bitter and swift end. If anybody was thinking that Trump may pick him as his uh, running mate, it seems this weekend Trump wrote in a post on his failed social media site that he isn't, quote, MAGA enough and that, quote, a vote for Vivek is a vote for the other side. Now, Ramaswamy has been one of the most pro-Trump candidates. And you think after being insulted the way that he was insulted, he would come out, take the gloves off. But no, he doubled down. He still says Donald Trump is the best president we've had in the 21st century and still kissing a little bit of behind. Does that lack of loyalty from Trump surprise you? And does the fact that um, Vivek Ramaswamy is pulling a Ted Cruz and a Marco Rubio and falling in line surprise you? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Like, like uh, the, the fact that anybody would be surprised after eight years, Donald Trump is only loyal to himself. Donald Trump only cares about himself. Vivek has been on his knees this entire race trying to, you know, ingratiate himself with Donald Trump. Uh, Vivek has learned that Trump doesn't give a damn about anybody but himself. To what Molly said, Republican donors and Republican consultants whatever the Republican establishment class has wanted Donald Trump to go away. But wake the, f I caught myself, Amy, <laughs> wake the hell up, America. Republican voters are behind this guy more than they ever have been. Yeah. The general election is starting now. We better wake up to that.